Welcome everyone and uh, welcome everyone that's uh, following us on YouTube, so I think I should look at the camera over there, to this uh, Lent term meeting of the Candela Blanche um, at Miguel Dolce uh, Fellows in Contemporary Spanish Studies. Uh, I am Jose, I am the Princess Professor and the head of the Candela Blanche Center. Yes, it's the Sanchez is the manager of the center. Today we have an exciting, an exciting presentation by three of the fellows. We're going to be discussing about their research topics and then I'm going to be receiving comments from the audience and comments, uh, feedback and comments uh, from myself. Um, I'm not going to go into long presentations because I don't think you want to listen to me. If you want to listen to the presentation by the fellows, I'm going to introduce very, very briefly the first fellow that's going to be talking. We have over here who is an assistant professor at the Department of Economics and Management at the University of Padua. Yeah, the floor is yours. You have got 20 minutes. Okay, so good evening, everyone. I am Chiara Gurlina I'm from the University of Padua, and uh, it's really a pleasure and an honor to present this evening, co-authored with uh, Roberto Antonici, that is a colleague of mine at the University of Padua, and uh, Andrea Rodriguez. So the paper is a digital capital and institution, a combined factor on income inequality in Europe. So basically, before going in detail to the paper, I just want to give you a hint about what is happening with the digital technology. So as you can see here from this graph, these are data coming from the European Investment Bank. Investment in digital technology in Europe are increasing over time. And in particular, this graph highlights uh, which are the technologies that have been most adopted in the last four years. So first of all, cloud technology are the most adopted one for what concerns the European digital firms. Then in this graph, I show you how uh, the digitalization process involves uh, differently countries in Europe. And in particular, both in 2017 and in 2022, the most, uh, let's say, digitalized one are those in the northern Finland, Denmark, and Sweden. However, the contribution of digital technology is very heterogeneous, both across countries and across. Finally, the, the third aspect to investigate when we talk about digital technology is the adoption of digital technology, in particular, how many of them are used by companies. So, uh, you can see uh, from the boxes on the left side the uh, those companies that implement just one digital technology and the boxes in the right side, those that, that oh, you can see really bad colors. Okay, anyhow, uh, let's say in the uh, bottom part is uh, those countries that have just one technology. In the uh, uh, upper part, there are those that implement more technologies. So you can see that, uh, uh, let's say, the implementation stage is quite high for what concerns Europe. So what we try to do here is uh, not only to take uh, uh, in consideration the rate of adoption, but also how this uh, affects the society. In fact, it's a common belief that normally uh, digital technology have a dual effect on the society. So from one side, obviously, they, uh, let's say, improve the well-being because they obviously people and for what concern companies, they speed up the production process, the supply process, and so on. But also they have a bad impact on the society. 
in fact, uh, let's say they increase uh, the job polarization, meaning that uh, just uh, more educated people are those uh, who develop high capabilities uh, that are the one required uh, by digital technologies, for example. So let's say the left behind workers are those that are more disadvantaged by the use and implementation of technology. So this is not just a belief, but it's also a being documented by the literature saying that digital technology requires high skilled workers and strong capability. And this in turn uh, gives a polarization. But what, which are, let's say, the factor that might affect this uh, polarization, so the digital divide? For sure, income, as I was telling you, digital technologies are those achievable from more educated people, and obviously more educated people uh, which, let's say, work in these uh, high capability, um, let's say, uh, sectors are those who have a uh, uh, higher But also it's a matter of education, so as I was telling you, better education. Uh, and also it's a matter of race uh, because minorities uh, normally could not achieve uh, this kind of education and so this kind of job. And also the geographical location. As I was telling you in the first slide, uh, Northern countries in Europe are those better endowed of digital technology. So for sure geogra geography matter. And we are going to see also in a while uh, for what concerns the European national region. So we have to consider all these factors when we talk about the digital divide, but also the role of institution. Actually, there are two types of institution that we are going to consider. The first one is a formal institution, and formal institution can reduce income inequalities or income disparities because they can favor the competition in the market, they can, they can increase the nature of it structure that are used to, uh, to digital technologies, and so let's say are objective ways to improve the investment in digitalization. What about informal institution? And in particular, what about the social capital? So we consider uh, basically two forms of social capital, which are bridging social capital, that is a, a relationship that emerges from a um, person who are not in the same network, okay? So let's say uh, are, are dissimilar or are yeah? And the fact that uh, they are heterogeneous among network facilitate uh, the, um, let's say, knowledge transfer for what concerns co cognitive flexibility and also speed up the technology diffusion. So persons that come from different background uh, have uh, more access to different knowledge and different information. Then we have a bond in social capital that uh, spread from, uh, let's say, similar or familiar uh, networks. So it's more related to, uh, let's say, the union, cultural activities, activities. And in this way, it facilitates the socialization and uh, how uh, people can, uh, let's say, come closer to the use of digital technologies or if they face some problem, it's more easier uh, for them to get help. So unfortunately, or let's say fortunately for us, because it's not a very investigative topic, there is just a very few paper analyzing how uh, informal institution might affect uh, the digital divide. So it's exactly what we are trying to do here. So we uh, want to test whether say, the role of a formal and informal institution can moderate the relation between digital technologies and income. So to do this, we assess two main hypotheses. So the first one is a sort of verification of the negative role of digital technologies on income inequalities, while the second one is our real contribution. So how these two forms of, uh, let's say, institution, both formal and informal, might moderate the relation. So to do this, we rely on several data sets. So first one, uh, the first one is uh, the uh, Euro uh, European Statistical Income Administration and uh, the Luxembourg Income Study to detect our variable for income inequality that is Then uh, we use the UCLAM database, that uh, is a database which collects the amount of investment in digital technologies for uh, uh, European country. And then I will uh, show you how we derive our measure. Then we have the World Bank uh, database for what concerns the formal institution and the European Social Survey for what concerns social capital, so the part of the formal institution. 
our unit of analysis, as I was telling you before, is uh, uh, are the last two regions in Europe, in particular one and in, uh, distributed uh, among uh, 11 European countries. And the time period is uh, 2006 until 2016. Unfortunately, we know that these data are quite old in the past. Uh, and uh, we hope uh, to get uh, more recent data, uh, in particular for what concerns uh, the bonding and bridging social capital. Okay, so as I was telling you, the G index uh, is our measure for income inequalities, uh, and it varies from zero, that are completely equal society, and to one uh, that are completely unequal. Then the UCLS database gives us the measure for uh, country in digital investment. So we weight this measure with the Ardeco database on gross fixed capital formation. So this measure in Ardeco database are at the regional level. So we divide basically the investment at country level for the measure in gross fixed capital formation at regional level. And thus we obtain a weighted measure at the regional level. The three uh, categories of digital technologies that we select are those that are connected to the ICT, let's say, so information and communication technologies, and in particular, computing equipment, communication equipment, and computer software and database. So we use these because ICT are those more related also to the involvement of person in the digital technology. And as I was telling you before, also before 2017, uh, this, uh, let's say, digital revolution started uh, in 2006. So forget about the economic crisis that throw down all the economic activities, and then we have a rebound and then a recovery in 2016. So let's say it's an increasing phenomenon over time. And this is uh, about the regional heterogeneity. So do you remember that I showed you about the country heterogeneity in the very first slide? Unfortunately, we have, you can see the color? Okay. So anyhow, uh, regions in the north of Europe are those uh, who are more down. And then you can see how France, for example, increased the amount of investment per capita in 10 years, let's say. So it should be darker here. Also, Italy is becoming darker. And unfortunately, Spain is, uh, let's say, in the same level uh, from 2006 until 2000 at least for these three technologies that we take uh, into consideration. Okay, then we have uh, the two uh, variables uh, of uh, bridging among bonding social capital, and as I was uh, uh, saying to you, are the regional participation to sport association, association, social welfare organization, and cultural activities for what concerns the bridging, and for what consists uh, bonding social capital are union, professional organization, or political organization. Then, for what concerns formal institutions, we use uh, the government effectiveness uh, that uh, fast. <laughs> okay. government effectiveness uh, that is uh, one of the four pillars of the quality of government index proposed by Kaufman and Cray. The other one are voice and accountability, rule of law, and control of corruption. And we believe that government effectiveness was one more suitable for our let's say, theoretical framework. Then we have three variables uh, to control for research and development. So the amount of investment per capita in R&D and is a quite a common uh, variable when we talk about digital technologies. Population density to control for agglomeration externalities in the region. And then uh, the human capital to control for the level of education that is one of the drivers of digital technology. Okay, so we estimate uh, first difference uh, regression approach because uh, we want to, uh, let's say, drop the unobserved fixed effect. And also, we are curious about the growth rate, uh, both for what concerns the income inequalities and the level of adoption of the So, basically, here we set the, uh, the, uh, the digital technologies, the cell, and then we have institution, and we are going to see bonding and bridging, so formal institution and formal institution. And then we have our moderating factors, so our interaction between digital technologies. Delta X is the vector control that I explained to you before, and here is the other side. Okay, very preliminary result. Okay. 
So basically what happened is that the informal institution seems to mitigate uh, the, uh, let's say, increase. So the first hypothesis that was related to the role of digital investment is positive meaning higher digital investment increase the level of inequalities, but it's not significant. So the sign is okay while the, the coefficient is not significant for our on the contrary, the uh, interaction term of digital investment uh, uh, multiplied by both bridging and both social capital is always highly significant and negative, meaning that uh, having more investment in digital technology moderated by the higher levels of social capital in a region decreases the level of income inequality for that sector. So, is that, let's say, even though the sign is negative, the effect is positive on our dependent variable. Because remember that the Gini is zero for perfectly equal society and one for perfectly unequal society. When we measure the effect of the government effectiveness, so the role of formal institution, we find no relevance for our coefficient, even though the sign was correct. And when we put together formal institution and informal institution, with bridging social capital and bonding social capital here, we find again that the bridging social capital as a moderator for digital investment is significant and decreases the level of income inequalities for that. So we are, let's say, quite happy until now for our results and until the questions to come. So we can say that the first hypothesis uh, is not uh, significant, so it cannot be verified. Well, for example, hypothesis two is verified for what concerns informal institution and not for what concerns formal institution. Okay, so let's say there is a lot of, of work to do still. These are just a very preliminary results and very preliminary conclusion. But we can say that this is another example on how such a capital might mitigate the fact of digital technologies within the let's say, income inequality framework, and in particular for what concerns the bridge of social capital. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Diana, for a very nice presentation. So it's uh, now time for the audience to ask questions. So who wants to start? Michael, please go ahead. Um, now, this, this is very interesting, I think, uh, quite from a couple of uh, Mind. So first thing, you cited the whole paper as institutional potential mitigating the negative effect of uh, uh, digital uh, technology. You don't find any effect of that was my first question. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. You don't find exactly. any negative effect. So how can you mitigate the, the negative effect if the negative effect is not there? What you're finding so far is that uh, in uh, regions where there is high level of social capital, the inclusion of digital te technology it reduces Gini uh, inequality. It reduces it well. So you can sell the, the paper in a different way. There's okay. no need to, for you to, to insist so much. I was but expecting to find a negative effect. Yeah, there. exactly. We, we were well expecting as well. But, uh, but, no. but, but, but that's not bad news, right? I mean, yeah. yes, there's just no reason to sell it this way. Okay. For me. Okay. So perhaps you want to uh, invest more time in, in discussing why the regions with uh, regions with better social capital are capable of benefiting the most from the inclusion and the adoption of that. Okay. Then so in equality. Yeah. Um, then I mean uh, questions referring to the way you're measuring this. Um, so you showed us uh, um, a map on investment in digital technology. So I wonder whether you're using investment or actual adoption. In your uh, in your regression, is investment. So this is this is investment. So regional investment. Okay, so it's not like uh, immediate adoption. No, no it's not like immediate. implementation. Uh, yeah. No, okay. just so, investment. Yeah, so I wonder whether this kind of relates with the uh, investment in general in uh, I don't know uh, infrastructure. Okay. You know, so. Maybe you wouldn't miss it down, yeah, okay. because you're not actually measuring adoption of these mm -hmm. things. That okay. And then, I mean, a question and I have because I mean, I've been working a lot with the press as well on institutions, and one problem we had of was like measuring change in institutions. So mm -hmm. I was wondering what what you had used uh, because you're you know trying to 
uh, account for fixed effects uh, by you using changing institutions. So uh, can you go into the details of how you're measuring that? Uh, how do you exploit the change? In it's just uh, the, the, the delta. So it's uh, the delta of the logarithm. Exactly. Yeah. But uh, so you, you're using, for example, the quality of government uh, index. Yes. So what are you using? Like 13, 2013 to 2017? Or no, actually, there are annual measures for that. No, there are no. not. Ah, no? Okay. The annuals is an extrapolation. There are only four points. Exactly. So I just have uh, okay, uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. It's a long difference. Yes. Um, and also, I mean, last question, and I did the floor. Um, you, you started saying that there's not much pressure on this topic, which mm -hmm. perhaps is true, but I think you have the possibility to link your analysis to the much broader literature that is emerging on the introduction of artificial intelligence and the effect on the labor market and quality in general. Because to a certain extent, although you don't find this negative, exactly. but mm -hmm. it's two things to be related. Okay, so not directly, of course, but you know, you can insert yourself within this broader. Okay, okay, so more than on the regional side, and say more the on the regional the side, side I'm, I'm not an expert on the topic, okay. uh, but uh, you just, again, you spend very little time on each slide, so it was a bit hard for me to follow each and everything. Okay, so uh, <laughs> but uh, what I grasped from this was uh, there's not much, so let's move on. Uh, so my my thinking at that moment was well actually maybe there's not much specific on this topic but at least broadly speaking this topic has been created quite a lot yeah, yeah. technologies yeah. Mm -hmm. no, yes for sure for technology side yes but not so much for what concerns uh, such as uh, I mean today to, to my best to the best of my knowledge I I'm not sure that has been so much investigated when you put together digital technology, income inequality, and informal institutions. Okay. So if you just stop at the digital technology and income inequality, yes. There no, is no, I totally buy that. Okay. Yeah. Also, I'm not an expert. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just yeah. in the if you want. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, but last thing, I didn't really understand what you're including in the three definitions of digital technology. Because it says you have three types, right? No, there are three. Yeah, three ways to measure these digital technologies. Okay. Computing equipment, communication equipment, computer and software database. So let's say the three main IT technologies. Okay, they're okay. both fairly similar because yeah, at some point I would think maybe you can differentiate, but they all look quite similar. No, because in this variable so. presented by the EU clans, that is the investment in let's say uh, EQ. So is uh, all these are on under the same the variable and this variable contain the information on this table. The computer yeah, so image. Yeah. Okay. Do you want to give any more answers to uh, Marcus questions? There were quite a lot. Uh, but maybe we have chatted uh, yeah. <laughs> Okay. Anyone else? Uh, more questions? Are you all satisfied with the presentation? Okay. So, uh, Victor, oh, Victor, go ahead. Yeah, I can ask some questions. And I guess it's about the two way, let's say, cause and effect in your regression. Because, I mean, what about the effect of inequality on institutions? I don't know if that's a. So, the reverse causality, so let's say. Okay. So, basically, we didn't talk about that. Yeah, I don't know if so, there's any way to address it or to, to solve that problem because I mean that's a big thing on that social capital perhaps for a effect it's playing there. Okay, so thank you for your question. I really don't know which is the correct way to answer yes. So also because when you have to instrument, let's say the interaction. It's a little bit tricky, so you end up with a very confused uh, at the end uh, table. Uh, you can instrument the variable taken separately, but uh, you miss uh, the point of the interaction. So we were actually thinking about how to deal with, uh, let's say, endogeneity bias, not the precise simultaneity one. Uh, so yes, we were reflecting on that. Thank you. <laughs> well, one of the answers. Potentially, is that institutions change very, very slowly okay. and probably change lower and a slower rate than inequality. It's not that inequality changes very quickly, 
Okay. In any way, but there are ways to address uh, potential endogeneity issues. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, no, thank you very much. I have comments. Uh, I think the main comment was the uh, first comment by by Michael. Uh, there are two ways of selling the paper. The first one is uh, like Mark has proposed. Another one is that most of the literature looking at, on the one hand, digital technologies and inequality has highlighted that they tend to promote inequality. Mm -hmm. um, do we find that? No. So the idea is maybe that is not happening, but we know that social capital, in particular bridging social capital, seems to contribute to reduce the effect, any effect that technology might have on the technology. That's, I think that's, that's a fair point. That's a very important point. So when I was thinking, yeah, we cannot sell the paper like that because it's mainly we're finding, perhaps in contrast to the literature, that there's no negative impact. In fact, you can go and implement digital technologies and it's not going to be detrimental for inequality under, if our results are correct, any section. Uh, second point, I, mean, I got the privilege that I got now a lot of uh, direct access to data uh, by the European Commission, and I was sent uh, yesterday, in preparation of the meeting we have next week, the data on access to high-speed broadband in Europe at a regional level. It turns out that, of course, you're measuring investment from your data set, that the uh, top country in Europe is Romania, at regional yeah, level. Yeah, and, and the second top is Spain. Exactly. It's not that a lot of things in, in Spain happen, followed by Portugal, and then you go to the north where Italy comes out as uh, at the bottom or almost at the bottom. Um, yet in the map, Italy seems to have been investing a lot where Spain has been investing nothing. So it would be good to double check the data just in case. Of course, you're measuring different things. But if you're buying computers, it's not, you're not buying a lot of computers when your internet is terrible. Um, so whether it would be good to check the data. And then the second thing, I know the data inside out, especially the inequality data. The data for Germany comes from the Luxembourg income study. All the other comes from EU Silk. When you put Germany there, sometimes the results go in all directions. So my advice would be run the analysis as well without Germany. And see whether the results stand or not, because if they don't stand, we might need to adjust it. If they, if they stand, uh, then we are. I'm surprised that many of the control variables don't appear as significant. So that might be also related to the fact that um, your R dependent variable fluctuates, normally depending on the source. So now I have to, to take out the, the gossip from the, <laughs> the world rover. In fact, the this variation turns out not significant because we drop out Romania this morning. Because we do realize that Romania was kind of outlier in our database and drive a lot of our results. So this is the reason why there were there were too many slides about the negative effect, the negative effect, and the negative effect. Then looking at the data with the Romania exactly in the top. Uh, quarter, let's say, the highest, more than Germany, more than Sweden, and we say, okay, yeah, Rami, less, yes. less many yes. so we well, say, the, okay, this Romania, is, yeah. Romania has got the fastest internet and the cheapest internet in the European Union, so that's, uh, yeah, so, that's so things you have to bear in mind, so maybe yeah. there's something, so if that. we introduce back Romania, the coefficient turns out significant, so it's incredible the power just of Romania in the equation. Yeah, I mean, so, I, I, I'm in two minds about getting rid of um, outliers because if they are outliers, if they are flutes, uh -huh. right, but in this case, yeah. there's some basis for reality. Okay, yeah, so with, the, with the Romania, the, the relationship, or the, I mean, the negative relationship or digital investment on the GDP coefficient. Then we say, okay, so no problem, this is an outlier, we have to remove it. And by removing Romania, you know, we do not obtain any more significant on the position. Right, so I, I saw uh, different results. Before. Exactly. The, uh, the yeah. reason why you saw different My main concern is not Romania. It's keep Romania for the moment and play without Germany. Okay. Because that affects the dependent variable. Okay. And that might have reverberations across the case. So, yes. So, and also because uh, Germany with the value is the first region and that's one rather than. So, yeah, maybe we can play it. 
Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Excellent. Well, thank you. So. The next one, so the next one to present is uh, Elena Renzullo, who is a finishing PhD candidate. What are you finishing? It's on you, right? Uh, <laughs> end, end of this year, hopefully. <laughs> you shouldn't look at your supervisor when you get those questions. Just say, I'm finishing now. So I'm finishing the next year in June. In June. Okay. You're going to defend next year. In June. Yeah. Are you going to submit the end of this year? Okay. Okay, <laughs> that, that's what I like about supervisors. You know, they are decisive and say you have to do this, and then you do it. So you're a finishing candidate uh, uh, for a PhD in economics at Kaposka University of Venice, one of the best located universities in the world. So, Elena, the floor is yours, and you have 20 minutes uh, to do your presentation. Thank you so much. So we continue to speak about the institution. So. There is some type of relation with the previous presentation, but our work, that is a very preliminary work, is about the relationship between institution and European creation process. And in particular, we focus our attention on one of the dimensions that we usually consider to measure um, the quality of institutions. So, for example, the level of corruption. But which is our research question? So, what we would like is whether the low quality of local institution affects the amounts but also the allocation of the European creation policy. What we meant for low quality of local institution, we will consider a very specific case, and that's uh, the one related to Italy. In Italy, we have the lowest level of government, that is municipality, in which the, in which the city council can be dissolved in case of uh, politicians that are colluded with organized crime. So we will exploit this uh, specific case and we will associate them, we consider them as low quality of institution. So of course, what we would like to do is to contribute with, uh, to the literature of institution and effectiveness of European creation. So what is usually claimed in this literature is that when you have better institution, of course, the uh, European cohesion policy are more effective in order to create uh, uh, regional development and economic So we try to see in some way which are the main mechanism that try the drives this results, and we use higher level of government because usually the analysis are performed at the regional or the national level, we use the municipal one, and we have a measure that mainly varies over time. So we will exploit this variation in our model. Why this question is relevant? First of all, because European cohesion policy are relevant. And this is even more important nowadays, and even in the last previous event of the Canadian Event Center, Many times we have stressed that for face uh, the new challenges of globalization, that we need, of course, to that the left behind region catch up with the other, but also we need more European. For adding both these two factors, we need that European cohesion policy are there. Of course, the goal of European cohesion policy is to create growth in the in the less developed regions but also to create a, um, a single European team. And there are studies that show that, um, that in some way, uh, this happens only when the European cohesion policy are effective. So for example, also uh, a voting or populist voting is lower when European cohesion policy are effective. The second point why, this is important, is the structure itself of the policy. Since it is for its follow up is the structure, so the local governments play a crucial role. And this is the reason why we would like to focus on it, because it can enhance the participation and the application for the different projects. 
but also because uh, the local government in Italy obtained a very large amount of funds. Um, we performed this analysis uh, looking at the data in Italy because it seems an ideal testing ground for two main reasons. Those are Italy is really featured by a long static reality between a developed north and a lagging south. So, of course, given the structure of the policy, that uh, southern Italy are the regions that obtain the largest amount of funds. And then, because there is a larger number of city councils that were dissolved because of collusion of the local government with organized crime, and in particular, we are speaking about Mafia, mafia infiltration. So, how do we measure the low quality of institution? We exploit one of the low, one of the strongest policy that the Italian government has by organized crime in Italy, that is low 174. And the goal was the, it's in some way give the chance the national government to dissolve local government anytime that there are direct or also indirect links between local politician and criminal organization. So in some way, we are, in this case, we have a local government that is not acting in a normal way. So the, there is a the normal functioning of the local administration is compromised. To give you just some hints about the cases of city council dissolution, so the case in which we are dealing with a low quality of government, in the time span that we are going to consider, that is between 2007 and 2020, we have 101 cases that are mainly concentrated, of course, in southern Italy, so we are speaking about the region of Sicily, Calabria, Campania, Puglia, and Basilica. Okay. To fulfill the goals of our analysis, we merged together different data sources. So the data coming uh, on the European cohesion policy comes from this wonderful database that is open cohesion, and which I will spend some word on. But the main point is that there are very detailed information. We have information at the project level, and then we merge it with information on local politician. Again, we have information at the individual level, so we know the sex, the age, the previous job performed by the local politician, and we merge all this information also with the, uh, with the city council dissolution. So in this case, we know when the dissolution happened, but we also collect all the records that explain, so PDF file mainly, that explain which were the reasons for which this, uh, the municipality was dissolved. And then we have a series of, uh, of socioeconomic and demographic control that comes from the ISAT population and housing trends of 2001. So let me spend some words on open cohesion as well on the European cohesion policy. Uh, we have information on the starting and ending date of each single project. And of course, also on the thematic objectives defined by the European uh, Commission. So here you can see from the small chart how broad is the goal of cohesion policy. There are investments from for research and innovation toward better education and training, and so on. And also, we know, um, of course, the title and a small summary of each project, and we really know who is getting the money. So who are the beneficiaries? And this is one of the uh, information that we have explored until now in our analysis, making the distinction between public and private beneficiaries to see whether in some way having a low quality of government can redistribute resources towards public or private or if nothing else happening. Last point, we have information about the payments. So we don't, we know not only the amount of money associated with each project, but we really know when the money are flowing. We have this information at the country data, and we merge all this information, creating a database that is a municipal year level. Okay, so we come to our identification strategy that is a sacred different design. So just to give you the intuition, what we are trying to do. We are trying to, in some way, verify whether the low quality of government 
has an impact, again, on the amount and on the allocation of the European fund. How we are doing that? We are comparing municipality with a low of, uh, quality of government. So municipality in which the local government is colluded with organized crime, with, with, those, with, 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 who, with, with those that have uh, colluded politicians or sorry, municipality with and without colluded politician and before and after the collusion. So we use both this dimension. So in a simple way, maybe the model is the following one. So our dependent variable are the amount of funding in logarithmic term and per capita. And then we have our main explanatory variable that is a dummy one and it's equal to one in case of local government that are then dissolved. In particular, this value is equal to one from the beginning of the legislature until the dissolution. And of course, this type of model is valid when we have a parallel trend. So when we have that some in term of outcome, there is the same trend between treaty that control municipality before the intervention of the treaty. We come to the results, very preliminary one. And here you can see the distinction, the relationship between low quality of institution and the total amount of funding. I have to show you something. Is we have two different samples, full sample and restricted one. I just spent one word, not much more, on what is the restricted sample. We have done uh, a work using the decree to determine the cases in which. Uh, uh, organized crime has influenced the election. Why we have done this? Because otherwise we will not be sure whether um, the politicians start to be colluded. If mafia has influenced directly the election, we can assume that from the day after the government in place was acting not in a normal way. We can say. How did we do that? We um, use the PDF of the decree and we select only those cases in which there were some keywords such as vote buying, violence against culture, and electoral competition. In this case, we have only 36 cases of city council dissolution, but it's a clear sample. Okay, so we can come back to our results and you can see that in most of the cases, have a negative relation between the institution and the total amount of funds. So it seems that worst local governments are less able to attract European funding. Other point, we pass then to see whether there is a distinction between private beneficiary and public beneficiary. And when we see, when we look at a private beneficiary, there is no any significant difference in the amount of funding obtained. So it seems that the low quality of institution is not influencing the uh, amount of funding obtained by private beneficiaries. So what we have done now then is to look at the public beneficiary. So what I meant for public beneficiary, here we are, um, public beneficiary are told me, for example, the regions, the municipality, or uh, university and so on and so forth. In all these cases, we have again, a negative relationship between the quality of institution and the total amount of funding of uh, I forgot just to tell you that the difference between column two and four is that in that case, we apply a matching procedure. So we are comparing the low quality of, of some municipality, not with all the other southern municipalities, but just to those that have more similar characteristics, the final socioeconomic and electoral control before 2007, 2020. So what we have done later on, because we were mainly also interesting to see whether in some way uh, colluded government also attract less funding for themselves in some way, if this effect mainly driven by municipality, and it seems to be like that in the sense that also in this case, we have a negative relation between low quality of institution and the total amount of funding obtained for the same institution. 
So in some way, the reason could be true. In some way, the low quality of government, low quality of government are less able to attract funding. Or on the other way around, it seems that the procedure to which the funds are allocated are working because those that will be then formally defined as polluted government are those that obtain less funding. Okay, just to show that some of them study for the variable that we have in each of us, they seem to be quite good. Okay, further steps. Since this is a very preliminary analysis, what we would like to do next, we would like to compute a series of robustness checks for example, replicate the analysis using not just the logarithm of the total of the funding, but the number of projects, since this is something that we have. Then what I would like to do is also focus the attention on the concentration of funding per beneficiary. And then what maybe is more interesting, we would like to exploit other sources of city council distribution. Until now, we just mainly focus our attention on the one related to a uh, colluded politician, but there are cases of this, of this solution, for example, because the government does not have any more the majority or because there are problems with the balance sheet and, try and use also these other cases to have maybe a more broader definition of the quality of government that is not related just to collusion and corruption. Uh, then, of course, is we have really to understand what is going on here. So to in order to do that, we would like to see whether we have coherence results or maybe not when we focus the attention on other type of transfer, for example, from the national state to the municipality or from the region to the municipality. And also we would like to see whether in this case, so in cases of low quality of institution, then also public procurement will be different. So we would like to identify the public procurement that are more suspicious in some way. So exploit, for example, the number of candidates or the timing of the call. Of course, if the call was just very, very short. There is the chance that there is a literature that shows that there is more chances of having corruption in, this, in that case. And so we would like to see what is happening have results that are coherent with the one that we have obtained looking at the European funds or not. Okay, so I just moved to the conclusion. So what we can do, what we can say until now is that for now we have found a negative relationship between the low quality of institution and the total amount of funding. So the worst institution are less able to attract European funds. And these results is mainly driven when we look uh, at public beneficiary. So on one side, this is of course a good news because it seems that less resources are managed by those that are the final polluted government. On the other side, are still, those are still getting less resources in a region that need to catch up with the others. So this will be of course a problem. So say that, thanks you for your attention. Thank you very much, Elena, for a very, very nice presentation. Comments, questions? No one was. Uh, uh, yes, okay. That's a, a small thing. Can you uh, give us your name? Uh, Romano. Romano. Okay. Yeah, my, my name. Uh, it's not where I'm from, it's my name. Okay. Uh, so, where are you from now that you mentioned? Let's speak out on one of the okay. okay. I I think, yeah. Well, yeah, they were also Romans, uh, like uh, a long time ago. But, yeah, yeah, like us. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, so sometimes it could happen that like um, municipalities, whatever happened that you're controlling for, like uh, mafia infiltration or criminality infiltration, um, the mayor, coalition, or another name, like uh, what happened, but then eventually over time, uh, they find out that it wasn't really the case. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Is there any way that you can account for we that? Have those information. Okay. Like, uh, yeah. We just consider those type of uh, dissolution that are in some way confirmed until one month ago. Okay. 
I cannot predict what is going to happen in the future months, but I believe that they will not change the standards of like four or five years ago. So we should be quite safe on this part. They are minority. Yeah. You know, but you know, someone could argue that, so it burns safe. Exactly. Yeah, just a minor comment or, or, or curiosity uh, from, from his question. I see that these effects are disappearing on time. I don't know. I mean, looking at the graph, uh, is that because when this collusion ends, uh, there are positive results, or is that it only happens in a few years and then? We don't see in our data, or at least here, you don't see the period after the dissolution. But in some way, this will also be given by the fact that these are four years after the election. And most of the cases of dissolution happen two years after the election, three years after the election. So progressively, we have less information. So in some way, this is less reliable than the previous point, we can say. OK, any other questions? Not my my comments. Thank you very much, uh, Elena, for a very nice presentation. Um, I find the analysis you're doing very exciting, very interesting. But I also find that you can do more uh, in a way. First, I have a a query um, about your main uh, institutional error, which is mm -hmm. whether there's collusion between local politicians and uh, criminal gangs at the local level. And this comes from the law 194 of uh, 1991 in Italy. Of course, when you are colluding with criminals, it's an illegal activity. So you mm -hmm. want to be found. So it all, it all depends on, you're not measuring whether this collusion is happening, you're measuring whether you're caught. Mm -hmm. And being caught depends on a number of factors. First, and I think you might need to elaborate a bit more, how good is the police? in Italy and in those regions of Italy where this pollution are identifying cases. It's not a question of being good and having the means, but how corrupt is the police? Is the police not colluding with criminal gangs or with colluding with politicians? That's another thing. And then if the poli police is amazing and not corrupt, how good are is the judicial system, especially the judges, and that, at actually processing those cases? Uh, how independent are they from political power and how non-corrupt or free from corruption they are. So these are things that you have to try to convince any reader to say, yes, we're measuring something that is close to what would be reality, and not just we're measuring what we capture. I know that is difficult, but I, I yeah. think you probably need to highlight that. And then the second one, which I think is far more substantial, substantial is about your dependent variable. Yeah. Because what you're measuring is how much money do they get? Yeah. from European clubs. It might be competitive, but at the end it's a political decision. And of course, it does matter a lot for local decision makers and for local people, but for me outside, say, as a European contributor, why do I care how much money this governments get? I should care whether the money actually leads to something. And, and what you should perhaps consider either for this paper or for another paper is changing the independent variable, sorry, the dependent variable, and looking rather than at how much money they get, what is the outcome of that money? Do they grow more? Do they increase well-being? Do they increase employment? And does the, do the returns of the funding that they get, so funding yeah. coming an independent variable, in places with higher levels of pollution or lower levels of pollution lead to different or radically different outcomes, which would be, I mean, the, the question that I would be much more interested if I were, let's say, the European Commission at the end with this, or as a European contributor, as a Spaniard paying my taxes that go then to, uh, let's say, structural funds that they make a difference. Now, this is something on which we can for sure work on, like, I can try to support our analysis and the goodness at least of the juridical branches of Italy and say that, for example, there are evidences of like that political issues do not influence so much the city council dissolution. So, for example, you have the same amount of city council dissolution when um, independently by the color of the municipality and the one of the national state. 
So at least this form is quite reassuring, but of course, I shall study a little bit more and try to defend as much as possible. But of course, there is always the possibility of a downward bias, we can say. And for the future, we can for sure try to also to link on in some way the effectiveness of European cohesion policy when there are this type of issue. For example, we have data on the firms, and we can try to link that with employment or using something that for now we use as a control. So the municipal reductible income that is what we have at the municipal level as a proxy of income. For sure, we can work on that. Okay, good. Just one final thing, uh, mm -hmm. which applies to you and to uh, Pierre as well. In terms of presentation, and I'm sorry, it's a professional uh, tradition, and uh, Giovanni has experienced that. Uh, you present very, very well. The only thing is, uh, you need to know who you are presenting to and how to present yourselves. And uh, if you go, sorry, if I move over here. If you do the presentation from here, um, I mean, I could see you because I was there, but mm -hmm. the camera's over there, the audience is here, you're protecting yourself, okay. you're, you are indicating that what you're saying, you're not really convinced, you're nervous, etc. Uh, and that actually undermines the effectiveness of your presentation okay. by a factor of two. Okay. If you do the same thing over here and say, hey, you looking at me in YouTube, and the audience, you're going to say exactly the same. The audience can actually see the screen without any problem. And they're going to think she's really much more convincing than what she, what you're doing when you're doing it behind the screen. So it's just a minor thing in terms of style presentation that actually can make a big difference. Can I say one thing? Sorry if I'm yeah, go ahead, go ahead. So regarding your first point, mm -hmm. uh, there is a recent relatively recent paper that has been published on uh, the American Economic Review from Italian researchers, and they do something similar, but at the firm level, to check how mafia or criminality in situation, you know, okay, so you already know, okay. I think maybe that could be um, worth checking as well. Is there any way you yeah. can do something similar here? We should work on it because I'm not sure that we can easily get information at the firm level. <laughs> Yeah, just one recommendation. You don't want to do things that are similar, you want to do things that are different. In, in my story, how much is good to build another, but if you can do it radically different, it's also Okay, thank you. Okay, so now we get to our Third and final Miguel Dos Fellows uh, fellow, and we have Gonzalo Reguera Taratiegui. I hope I pronounce your uh, surname uh, adequately, even with uh, yeah. Spanish surname, sometimes it becomes a bit difficult. Who is a PhD candidate? I have to ask the same question as I did to Elena. How long before you finish? Uh, no, uh, it's my second year. All right, so you've still got some time. <laughs> is it a four year PhD or is it a three year PhD? It's three years. Three years. So you're almost about to finish. <laughs> Okay, and uh, is a PhD candidate in I communities at the Institute for Advanced Social Research at the University of Navarre in public. Yeah. So, floor is yours. You got twenty minutes. No, so yes. Yeah, before I start, I want to kind uh, of plan. So, Dr. Under the so Victor, with the opportunity. I'm a sociologist, so uh, could be something different. But There's I'm nothing not... wrong with being a sociologist. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, I'm going to talk about accessibility, mobility, and social inequalities. And I try to read some case, some tips, just to uh, study and research the, the rural gap. Okay. No, that's a great introduction myself. Yeah, next on the next topic. I am uh, my supervisor, Professor Rivas, and the project where I bring in my 
Möller sellest. Ja hän on nyt alkaa olla territorial kohtuusioon. So let me, as we know, yes, in Europe, uh, 100 million people live in 50,000 tons. Uh, well, uh, it's important because uh, the future is uncertain. And also, we have uh, a very strong problem with the egg, and uh, also the measuring of the stumps. Does make a joke with your paper? Uh, what happens with the model now of going to big cities? What happens the problem? The model is we also uh, just with the big blocks. We get the, the discount is not for the rest of the towns, the rest of the cities, the towns. An expression of that is like the protest, like the Revuelta de la España Bastiana, the empty Spain. But the question that I, I want to remark is. It is hard to talk about the population. Well, for us, uh, the middle of the population must be in those countries because in this light, a lot of challenges. And it's more uh, correct just to speak uh, of territorial balance and economics, just to, to remark uh, this thing. Well, my, my thesis is from it in rural access project when we analyze the the rural demands that exist and so this is for mobility and accessibility. Here's the research team. Okay, good time. Sí. Well, uh, so I'm from, uh, from Pamplona, from Navarra. This is like uh, my I study in Navarra as, as a case study. And give me, let me uh, let's talk to important points. Yes, uh, 50% of the population lives in towns and cities, but we have the problem that the 50% of the population lives in Pamplona and around the surrounding area. And if we have like uh, population projections in 10 years, we have again problems, but also the problem that Pamplona is uh, continuing growing and the less part of uh, the surrounding And this is important for. Um, territorial cohesion policies. Well, the idea of rural, uh, rural gap is a clear reflection of the modern rural questions, and Amarillo and Oliva uh, makes this definition like uh, this is a set of rural urban difference that solve the continuing complexity of rural areas, just to research the standard of quality of life, the mid region, and life opportunities of urban areas. And this is more. Preference just yes, uh, in order to theorize uh, the rural gap. And as it's important uh, that we are working on the southern Europe, which is fine difference. But I want to remark uh, the core declaration that uh, is quite important. We got uh, points of social recapitulations of many regions, prevents them for taking benefits from the programs provided by the European Union, and this is very important for the rural gap. As well, um, accessibility is like a issue that uh, we do research and be more important when you have this social territorial official. But normally we confuse accessibility <coughs> with mobility. Uh, and I want just to give some tips to study the, the accessibility. Well, uh, my approach is quite radical. For us, uh, it's a measure of social inequality. There are a lot of definitions, but this is that the one most I have. Well, um, in the study of rural activity, we have five dimensions, like the population, that is the initial group with different characteristics, economic difference, the territory, the different form of location, the infrastructure that's incorporated, the different speed that we have, which is possible to drive, and such service. Arrangement and the cost as all the cost. And we incorporate um, a five another dimension like this. just the study the transport as a service. Well, um, the study of facility the magmas for the third part is this fourth point. Mobility, the increase and dependence of automobility, aging and dependency, the relation of service and user administration in the park. Plus the digital divide, 
and also public and private marriage models with the problem of uh, inverse mobility. So we have a uh, few weeks ago the opportunity to meet the go uh, governors of the state. They have this report that points that a rural in Alta has to travel some uh, 22 kilometers to reach a school, a high clinic. Uh, this is a distance 10 times greater than an urban in Alta. And this is important because uh, this distance uh, is a way just to the study the accessibility, but it's not the same for a teenager or for other people. They have uh, different ways just to reach the distance. Uh, so it's important uh, the digital device that this report shows. They make a uh, yes, uh, typology of service of general interest. Um, this is uh, the complete indicator. That's uh, the start from the service and the distance that uh, we need to create this. And if we go to the data, we saw that the, the data is not good. Spain, there are weak difference between service in rural areas and urban areas. And if we continue to study this gap, we feel that the people or habitants from rural areas have more difficulty just to go to top, uh, food shops and they, they, they have out of problems and also inequalities in order to to the bank, uh, mail service, public service, all the all this thing. And also there's also a problem with the uh, elder people with uh, plus the loneliness and also the problems that uh, is very huge in, in the state. Uh, uh, the type of house schools we have a lot of elder people just living alone. And they get more problems just in order to, to access to, to service than this kind of shops. Well, uh, when we talk about accessibility, we also need to talk about uh, the quality. This is a doctor office in, in Asturias, and this bench is um, like the waiting room. So you can expect uh, in this condition the, the quality of service. Uh, and also, this is a, like a 24 hours uh, pharmacy where you can buy some products, but in case uh, of an emergency, you can you are, uh, you are able to buy some medicine. So this is this is not the the problem. So the way that we need to go. And also, we go to uh, the incomes. Uh, it's what I told you before. Uh, we have the problem with mobility and accessibility, and rural inhabitants need to uh, to make more uh, they spend more just in in transport, and there's some some data just in order to to solve that. Also, when the, things, the young people they need to go to a school, so the the percentage of the expenditure in transport is higher than from an urban inhabitants. Well, the data is uh, that I saw very well. But I, now I want just to talk uh, some case uh, about the rural mobility, everyday mobility, as we know, plays an essential role in supporting social, economic, and residential unemployment relations. But the problem is that uh, it's sustained by auto mobility. And this is like Another form uh, of inequalities. Well, uh, and also the problem of government is to face. For one thing, uh, we have uh, the opportunity to the social sustainability of rural areas, the look at routine of expensive uh, social groups, but also the, the long distance collision. But on the other hand, we have like uh, privatized accessibility. This is quite important with migrant people. And also the problem of public transport is like the, the car dependence erosion the, all the collective uh, transport. And also reforms of their gender and, and income uh, inequalities. The territorial structures and which uh, makes 
and generates a lot of inequalities. And as we, we need to move to a sustainable mobility, but the problem is that the, the policies are based uh, on urban policies, uh, urban with. And the challenge, well, uh, we are talking about the digitalization and digital web problem, the energy challenge, or to a post, uh, carbon mobility, but the most important case is the, the governance of the uh, moving to a new paradigm of, of mobility. Well, uh, with this car dependency, uh, for us, uh, this is like the, the, need, the next steps that we need to go, just because uh, neglecting mobility policies contribute to the population and rural divide, the rural decline. So we need uh, public policies to bring service closer together, public policies to reduce cost overruns. We also need to attend the immobility groups, young people, migrants, elderly, women, and also the education. Uh, my tutor research plan, yes, my lines of where uh, working on the right job, what mobile means, air, for energy, mobility transition, local power, and gender emission. At this moment, I'm working in, in this paper. So that's all. And thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Gonzalo. So, questions from the audience? Yes, Michael, go ahead. Thanks for the presentation. This is a very important, interesting topic with the rural health divide. Um, so you treated this uh, issue from like a static perspective. So you, you gave us um, a description of what the situation is in given uh, regions in Spain. Um, I have uh, uh, I the same question I was going to ask. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I have research that conducted recently on the Italian case where we look at reduction of services and in particular education services over time of the last decades and how this has induced depopulation from peripheral towards central areas. Um, with Andres, we have a paper at uh, uh, infrastructure investments and we demonstrate that it is uh, local uh, investments or so connection within region from center to periphery, but within a given area that is more conducive to economic growth. So I was wondering whether you can say anything about the tendency that you have observed in the Spanish case in terms of you know, service provision, healthcare, uh, education, and infrastructure so accessibility, because what you, you know, described to us was just what you've seen and the latest data. What, what, what is the trend? You know? Yeah. No, uh, this is an important point because uh, in this paper, uh, so all uh, the physical report is marking the, the left side. So, uh, so I'm going now in uh, three months to, to train with uh, this department. Uh, um, well, uh, I just want well, just to introduce uh, like the, the core of my thesis. But uh, this line is like uh, where we that we like just to, to scroll and yes, I we had so have the the problems with the data because uh, Navarra is just not two regions, but uh, if we want just yes, to make a comparison with another regions, we have some problems with the uh, we get. Uh, so yeah, it would be interesting for you in your, in your research to demonstrate whether, you know, in terms again of education and healthcare services, there has been a progress reduction in these peripheral places that have induced this population from peripheral towns towards core areas. I think it would be a, a good add up to your, your research. Yeah. No, I yes, uh, for some part, yes, uh, the first. Yeah, yeah, yes, in Navarra, yeah, yes, in Greece, uh, like uh, new policies, like uh, this is the end boost, yes, in order to try to, to reduce all these, these problems. This is in Tafaya, this is a 
la prioridad tu, tu Pamplona, o, o la educación en particular, te da con tu solo with this, que no te puede disipar. There are two problems with the nine soldiers de With this, oh, this is this map. Uh, we have the, this world. So the, this is Pamplona. This is all the areas. And this, the roads is over here. And if you uh, stay here, it's like a you don't have a project. A project. And so this is a very nice area. And this we have, have uh, a very huge problem of, 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 of cognition and also develop. Uh, it's, it's very difficult. Uh, it's, uh, we know uh, uh, we have all the diagnosis, all the data, but Juan Corona is like a, like a, our Madrid. No, it's. Thanks. Any other questions? No, not my, my turn then. I'm going to be a devil's advocate and I'm going to start by asking, very nice presentation, but I'm going to start by asking a uh, a question that I shouldn't be asking, but it's a question. Now, just leave it where you have it. Oh, okay. than that, um, which is what my all my colleagues would ask as the first question. So, if you had a region of the size of Navarre, where 50% of the, a bit more than uh, half a million people, yeah. almost less than 600,000, mm. uh, 56% of the population lives in in um, in Pamplona, and with some of the best hospitals in Spain, some of the best uh, schools in Spain, with a very good, because it happens, and Michael knows very well, that in Spain we have some of the best road infrastructure in the world. Why should we care about investing here when no one lives, so in Rontes Valles, and not just say, look, uh, you got some of the best services relatively close, where it takes you 20 minutes or 30 minutes, better to reinforce for the whole of the population than to try to put services that are going to be set part there. So first question, why should we care? Second question is exactly what Marco was saying, but I'm going to repeat it because I think it's, it's very important. You're looking at the statics and anyone living here in the Prepyrenees knows already from the beginning that their services are not going to be as good as in Pamplona. And even here, they say, well, the map doesn't stop here. You can go to San Sebastian, which is closer, and you have even the same quality services, if not better. But if they live here, they know that the services are not going to be good. So they're not going to get angry if they don't get the same sort of uh, the pharmacies and the access to the supermarket, etc. What they're going to get angry is if their services that they had when they moved there, when, when they were born, actually decline. So the important thing is what can you really tell about changes, not about differences in accessibility at a given point. Has it improved or not, etc. So, mm -hmm. no, so for us, this is a main challenge. This area, we have a, a lot of immigrants from Morocco, and this is a, like their high challenge, like to make a, yes, to work on the social cohesion actually. And for us, this is like a, the problem is that this is Marioja, so Aragon, and other regions, but we detect that there is a so huge problem over here, so it's not. Um, well, so I just talking about uh, territorial competition, but also social competition. Okay. Any other questions? Yeah. If not, Two lives on presentation. How many slides do you have? Uh, I have extra. No, no, I don't want the extra. How many slides have you presented? It's uh, around 45. 45, and you did it in 12 minutes. I calculated that you did it in 12 minutes. Yeah. Um, for next presentation, less slides, less words, and clear messages. Yeah. So, because I, you're trying to do a lot of things. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah, this is a problem. And uh, yeah. I mean, I'm getting old. My brain is uh, decaying somewhat. Uh, but I want to have things processed and say, what can I get from Opal's presentation? Yeah, yeah. And you can do the same and get the same messages with 10 slides with a lot of 
more figures, more graphs, more results, uh, rather than to try to say everything with a lot of words that then we cannot you know, really follow. And I think it would be far, far more effective. Second thing, Victor has given you a pointer. And a pointer allows you to move the slides. So if you have to keep on moving backwards and forwards, because with 45 slides, you spend more time just, oh, yeah, yeah, moving like that. I mean, this is the best way to do it, like this, and that's it. And it allows you to engage much more with the audience rather than to have to be worried about what your, when you have to go back to change the slide and then going back and look at the, the screen. Yeah. I mean, uh, sometimes we think in academia, we have to convince everyone with a lot of information and a lot. Of, no, you have to convince by the strength of your arguments and the clarity of your arguments, which very often imply messages that are clear from a clear research question. So thank you very much. And And thank you very much to all of you for coming here, and uh, especially to the three that actually gave uh, such an interesting uh, lighting presentations. Thank you very much for uh, also coming uh, to attend to uh, this lecture. Thank you very much to those at home or wherever you are for watching us on YouTube. Keep on connecting to the center, uh, the Kenyan Center, through Twitter, through LinkedIn, through our YouTube channel. Because we have had quite a lot of exciting events this term, and we're going to end up with a bang because on the 31st of March, we have Nadia Calvino, the first vice president of Spain, who's going to be in a dialogue with Minou uh, Shafiq, our president and vice chancellor here in LSC, on the idea of whether we are going towards a new economic paradigm. So if you're in London, please come and join us in, uh, in person. If not, the event is going to be broadcast, and it's going to be broadcast to all the world through our famous YouTube channel. So thank you very much once again, and see you all at the next meeting. Well, thanks, Victor, for all your help with the logistics. Thank you.